it's my great pleasure to be in the company of Dr. Richard Walker, who has given us some of his very valuable time uh, before he lectures at the 9th London Anti-Aging Conference to come and chat to us. So I'd like to say good afternoon, Dr. Walker. How are you, Phil? I appreciate being here. It's a great pleasure. Thank you so you much. You embarrassed me with such a friendly and laudatory oh, greeting. It's our pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> great. So, Dr. Walker, if I could, could I ask you, if you, would you be kind enough to tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, your qualifications, and the positions you hold today? Well, uh, my career, uh, as you probably can see from my face, has been a long, long <laughs> career. <laughs> I've had decades of uh, working in the science of anti-aging, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I began my work on uh, getting my PhD from Rutgers University. Mm -hmm. And uh, thereafter, I took a, a faculty position at Clemson, uh, where I was uh, uh, assistant professor and mm -hmm. subsequently associate professor mm -hmm. of biology. But um, somewhere along the line, I decided I need more education, so I took a several postdoctoral fellowships. And one was in Emory uh, at, at this College of Medicine in, in Atlanta, mm -hmm. um, where I studied neuroanatomy and uh, electrophysiology. Uh, then I did a year at Duke Medical Center where I worked uh, on uh, neuropharmacology mm -hmm. and neurophysiology, specifically reproductive physiology of aging. Uh -huh. Because by this time, my career developed into a focus on understanding aging and its mm -hmm. causes and its consequences. Mm -hmm. and then I uh, was fortunate enough to have a final postdoc for two years at Berkeley uh, with uh, Dr. Paula Timmers, who's the late Dr. Paula mm -hmm. Timmers, uh, who uh, was very helpful in uh, uh, launching my career uh, thereafter, um, uh, I went to the University of Kentucky Medical Center, the Sanders Brown Research Center on Aging, mm -hmm. and was very fortunate to receive NIH grants there and also Department of Defense grants to work on uh, my interest, my research in aging. Um, uh, I was tenured there and I stayed in the medical school and in the, in the research center on aging for five years. Uh, but then was sort of wooed away, if you will, <laughs> by uh, money and uh, alternative uh, alternative ventures in industry. Where I went uh, to Smith Smith Klein uh, mm -hmm. at that mm -hmm. time was Smith Klein Beecham, mm -hmm. um, where I was assistant uh, assistant director of yes. um, um, uh, uh, reproductive uh, toxicology. Mm -hmm. Uh, after a stint there, I went back to academia. I found I was better suited to the laboratory than to the uh, Fair enough. to the halls of uh, corporations, and um, uh, finished my career, if you will, at the University of South Florida, mm -hmm. where I now am located. Mm -hmm. I uh, stayed there for uh, ten years, and I, I retired there as the uh, director for uh, research and research compliance. Uh, and then, after retiring, I started my own company a consulting company for physicians mm -hmm. uh, called uh, Physicians uh, Scientific Research mm -hmm. uh, Incorporated. So uh, I continue to write. I'm an editor-in-chief now of mm -hmm. uh, uh, Clinical Interventions in Aging. It's, right. a, it's a journal for practitioners of anti-aging medicines published by Dove Medical Press Very good. in New Zealand and in London here. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, basically that's it. That brings us up to date. My research lately has been working with um, uh, unique children that mm -hmm. seem to show a significant retardation of development because mm -hmm. this f forms the basis for my research in aging. I could talk more about that That's some other time. That's wonderful. Very informative and very impressive. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Walker. That's a very impressive list. Um, and I know that one of your areas of expertise is, is around growth hormone and some of its uh, analogues like uh, semerelin. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that today, if you don't mind. Um, but, but just before we go there, I wonder if you could remind our viewers, what are some of the benefits of um, having, shall we say, uh, normal uh, growth hormone levels? Well, um, that question in itself is provocative to some mm -hmm. extent. I've mm -hmm. been trained in endocrinology uh, as uh, a doctoral mm -hmm. uh, candidate, and then also did, as I told you before, some postdoctoral training in uh, neuroendocrinology, especially mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of reproductive senescence. Right. Uh, in terms of that aspect, growth hormone is perhaps one of the most important endocrine hormones we have. Mm -hmm. It's somatotrophic. I mean, the name is somatotrophin, mm -hmm. implying that it has an influence over the entire body. Mm -hmm. And indeed, that's the case. Uh, the fact is that the levels or the concentrations in the blood are mm -hmm. never a constant. They've changed. Mm -hmm. They change throughout life. They're high 
early in life and then they decline thereafter. So what one says for normal really mm. is mm. somewhat of a statistical question rather mm. than a, a biological or medical one. Mm. Uh, what we know uh, that is, is relevant, at least to my interest and the interest of people in, that study aging, mm -hmm. is that the declining levels of hormones that occur um, after we become adults mm -hmm. and then proceed to very low levels uh, in older age <clears throat> really represent an insufficiency, mm -hmm. not a frank growth hormone deficiency, but an insufficiency that has ramifications because the absence of growth hormone or the reduction of its concentrations as we grow older mm -hmm. uh, definitely contributes to changes, maladaptive changes in right. our body, right. such as reduction in bone mineralization, loss mm -hmm. of muscle, mm -hmm. uh, uh, effects on circula circulation, mm -hmm. uh, protection of the, through, immune, through the immune system. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, there have been um, um, concerns mm -hmm that the loss of growth hormone or the reduction in growth hormone has medical implications, and I believe they do as well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that the consequences of aging, the manifest consequences, mm -hmm. uh, can be abated to some extent by uh, altering, the, clinically altering, the levels of growth hormone that exist in the body. I see. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again, Dr. Walker. That's a, a very interesting insight. And of course, we, we should also mention, of course, that whilst there are these advantages, shall we say, to having a, a good growth hormone level, uh, that there are also some issues, uh, not just the regulatory issues, surrounding growth hormone replacement. Would, would you like to say something about that? Yeah, a actually, you're right. There are some disadvantages, but these mostly relate mm -hmm. uh, to the doses, not the dose, but mm -hmm. the but the the form in which the molecular form in right. which um, uh, growth hormone is administered. Now, mm -hmm. <coughs> when the first there was really first interest in growth hormone as a replacement paradigm, mm -hmm. uh, it came from the studies of Rudman in the '90s, mm -hmm. who showed that uh, older men. Uh, using growth hormone on, on, a base, on a regular basis for six months mm -hmm. showed improvement in body composition mm -hmm. primarily. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, since then, um, uh, and this has been now several decades, couple decades, mm -hmm. uh, people have been using recombinant growth hormone less, less so lately than mm -hmm. they were before. But associated with this hormone are some side effects, and these mm -hmm. include um, changes in glucose metabolism, mm -hmm. the, and again, it's related to dose. Um, has to do with the fact that when one administers growth hormone, the recombinant growth hormone, yes. you're basically using it as a drug because you're injecting the amount of, of, of hormone that you choose, mm -hmm. but it's coming into the body mm -hmm. as a single bolus um, presentation, and, mm -hmm. it ex and it extincts uh, as a square wave. So, so mm -hmm. what we have is a initial high level after injection, and mm -hmm. it goes down, 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 down. Yes. So <clears throat> unless you have really a perfect titration of dose, mm -hmm. then you can exceed uh, the body's, um, uh, not expectation, but the body's familiarization mm -hmm. with the growth mm -hmm. hormone. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you then can have alterations in blood pressure, for example. Mm -hmm. And as I was saying, um, when you administer growth hormone, mm -hmm. uh, you're really administering the final product of the pituitary gland. Right. So uh, physiologically, this mm -hmm. is not uh, presenting itself to the body as mm -hmm. the body normally would present growth hormone mm -hmm. to itself. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there's a tendency for downstream to be hyperstimulated, and as a result, then initially, you can get metabolic alterations, you also yes. can get tachyphylaxis or, or down regulation to the mm -hmm. effects. So while you might get a significant, significant effect initially, it'll, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll, it'll attenuate after time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, these feedback effects also, in a, in a paradoxical way, accelerate aging of the of the pituitary gland. And right. there are many reports, although one sticks in my mind, showing that the receptor for the uh, neurohormone, growth hormone releasing hormone, mm -hmm. actually downregulates when you use recombinant growth hormone. So there's a strong negative feedback on the pituitary gland, yes. accelerating its inability to produce growth hormone. Right. And so it's counterproductive in that sense mm -hmm. when we consider what aging is doing mm -hmm. to the growth hormone axis. Aging is causing it to decline and wane anyway. Mm. So by administering the end product, we're essentially accelerating the decay of the pituitary. Mm. Alternatively, what we mm. like to do is to actually find a way to stimulate as much of the axis, the, the growth hormone axis as we can, mm -hmm. to generate a normal physiological response. Now, growth hormone 
is released episodically, so mm -hmm. it comes out in pulses. Mm -hmm. This is different from when you inject recombinant growth hormone, which is a square wave phenomenon. Yes. So I have an interest in uh, anti-aging medicine that focuses on what I like to call primary locus intervention. Mm -hmm. If we can get to the highest level of intervention to simulate the physiology of the whole system, mm -hmm. then we really are doing our job as best we can. So <clears throat> presently, we can't get into the brain yet and give a specific stimulus to the uh, nuclei that secrete GHRH. Mm -hmm. We don't have that capacity. We can create non-specific stimuli, mm -hmm. uh, such as those with L-DOPA or insulin or mm -hmm. some other uh, factors, clonidine. Mm -hmm. But we can give a specific stimulus to the pituitary gland. Oh. And there is a molecule that is an analog of growth hormone releasing hormone, the yes. brain hormone, yes. and that's called semorelin or semorelin, mm -hmm. however it's pronounced in different places. But mm -hmm. basically what mm -hmm. that is, is an analog of the naturally occurring hormone and consisting of the first 29 amino acids right. that's been cut when, when, when um, uh, uh, Guillemin first discovered the molecule mm -hmm. back in the 70s, really. Mm -hmm. One of his postdocs, Bill Wernberg, cut the molecule in pieces until he found that the first 29 amino acids were all that were necessary to specifically bind the saturable, saturable receptor mm -hmm. in the pituitary gland mm -hmm. and to initiate the cascade of intracellular functions that created uh, or that, that stimulated the production of message mm -hmm. and then the transduction of that message into growth hormone. Mm -hmm. What happened then was the pituitary filled with growth hormone so that signaling uh, any kind of normal signaling would be amplified and one would get a better uh, episodic release. Yes. And so in that case, uh, in this case now, we're really sort of simulating physiology. We're replenishing the growth hormone insufficiency, Yes. but we're also doing it in a way that is relatively free of side effects. Right. Uh, the reason being, now we are using the feedback system not to shut things down above, yes. but to regulate the levels of growth hormone that actually release from the pituitary gland. Very interesting. And there's one thing that's peculiar, uh, not peculiar, it's peculiar to the pituitary, mm -hmm. is that stimulation of these cells upregulates, not downregulates. Oh, I see. So therefore, you don't get a tachyphylaxis by using semorelin. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You actually improve the performance of the replacement therapy. Right because not only are you stimulating more and more message, but you're also increasing pituitary reserve uh -huh. so that daily injection is not necessary. Right. Uh, although it's good, it keeps the pituitary full, Yes. but over time uh, it is sustained and the pituitary reserve will go, even if you miss it there too, right. you'll continue to get uh, output, a normal physiological output yes. of the pituitary growth hormone. That's very interesting. We must talk a little bit more about semorelin. Thank you.